Hi, I'll continue with paragraph 25 of the chapter on ornaments in general in Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach's Versuch über die wahre Art, das Klavier zu spielen. Da man bei unserem heutigen Geschmacke, wozu die italienische gute Singart ein ansehnliches mit beigetragen hat, nicht mit dem französischen Manieren allein auskommen kann, so habe ich die Manieren von mehr als einer Nation zusammentragen müssen. Ich habe ihnen einige neue beigefügt. Ich glaube auch, dass bei dem Klaviere sowohl als anderen Instrumenten die Spielart die beste sei, welche auf eine geschickte Art das Propre und Brillante des französischen Geschmacks mit dem Schmeichelhaften der welschen Singart zu vereinigen weiß. Die Deutschen sind hierzu besonders aufgelegt, solange als sie von Vorurteilen befreit bleiben. Indessen kann es wohl sein, dass einige mit dieser meiner Wahl von Manieren nicht gänzlich zufrieden sein würden, weil sie vielleicht nur einem Geschmacke geschworen haben. Ich glaube aber, dass niemand mit Grunde in der Musik etwas beurteilen kann, als wer nicht allerlei gehört hat und das Beste aus jeder Art zu finden weiß. Ich glaube auch, nach dem Ausspruch eines gewissen großen Mannes, dass zwar ein Geschmack mehr Gutes als der andere habe, dass dem ungeacht in jedem etwas besonders Gutes stecke und keiner noch nicht so vollkommen sei, dass er nicht noch Zusätze leide. Durch diese Zusätze und Raffament sind wir so weit gekommen, als wir sind und werden auch noch immer weiterkommen. Dieses kann aber unmöglich geschehen, wenn man nur eine Art vom Geschmacke bearbeitet und gleichsam anbetet. Man muss sich, gegenteils, alles Gute zu Nutze machen. Man mag es finden, wo man will. Da, also, die Manieren nebst der Art, sie zu gebrauchen, ein ansehnliches zum feinen Geschmacke beitragen, so muss man weder zu veränderlich sein und den Augenblick jede neue Manier, es mag sie vorbringen, wer nur will, ohne weitere Untersuchung annehmen, noch auch zu viel Vorurteil für sich und seinen Geschmack besitzen, aus Eigensinn gar nichts Fremdes annehmen zu wollen. Freilich gehört alle Zeit, eine scharfe Prüfung vorher, ehe man sich etwas Fremdes zueignet. Und es ist möglich, dass mit der Zeit durch eingeführte, unnatürliche Neuerungen der gute Geschmack ebenso rar werden kann als die Wissenschaft. Indessen muss man doch, ob schon nicht der Erste, dennoch auch nicht der Letzte in der Nachfolge gewisser neuer Manieren sein, um nicht aus der Mode zu kommen. Man kehre sich nicht daran, wenn sie anfangs nicht alle Zeit schmecken wollen. Das Neue, so einnehmend es zufeilen ist, so widerwärtig pflegt es uns manchmal zu sein. Dieser letzte Umstand ist oft ein Beweis von der Güte einer Sache, welche sich in der Folge länger erhält als andere, die im Anfange allzu sehr gefallen. Gemeiniglich werden diese Letztern so strapaziert, dass sie bald zum Ekel würden. Da die meisten Exempel über die Manieren in der rechten Hand vorkommen, so verbiete ich diese Schönheiten der Linken ganz und gar nicht. Ich rate vielmehr jedem an, alle Manieren mit beiden Händen für sich zu üben, weil sie eine Fertigkeit und Leichtigkeit andere Noten herauszubringen verschaffen. Wir werden aus der Folge sehen, dass gewisse Manieren auch öfters bei dem Basse vorkommen. Außerdem aber ist man verbunden, alle Nachahmungen bis auf die geringsten Kleinigkeiten nachzumachen. Damit also die linke Hand dieses mit einer Geschicklichkeit verrichten könne, so ist nötig, dass sie hierinnen geübt werde, indem es widrigenfalls besser sein würde, die Manieren, welche ihre Anmut verlieren, sobald man sie schlecht vorträgt, wegzulassen. Man wird aus dem Folgenden sehen, dass die 
dem zweiten Teil meiner Sonaten beigefügte Erklärung einiger Manieren, welcher der Verleger unter meinen Namen, ob schon wieder meinen Willen und Wissen anzuhängen, sich nicht entblödet hat, falsch ist. Ich bin hieran so unschuldig, als an der Herausgabe der im Lotterschen Katalogus aller musikalischen Bücher von diesem Jahre auf der achten Seite unter meinem Vor- und Zunahmen und folgendem merklichen Titel befindlichen Sex Sonatas Nouveau per Cembalo 1751. Ich habe diese Sonaten noch nicht zu sehen bekommen können. Ich glaube aber ganz gewiss, dass sie mir entweder gar nicht zugehören oder dass es wenigstens alte und falsch geschriebene Stücke sein mögen, wie es gemeiniglich zu geschehen pfleget, wenn jemand etwas heimlich erschleichet und hernach herausgibet. So, that's the, the chapter on ornaments in general. I just wanted to say something about, again, touching on the relevance of what Bach says. What he, when he, what he was saying there about when something is new, how, you know, if it, if it doesn't please right away, just ignore that. And I think that can be connected to what I was saying about, as well about arrogance and ignorance that arrogance being a part of ignorance and that when, when your arrogance says this isn't relevant to me that um if you can ignore it just just ignore it just let like let yourself think that and ignore it and think well what if it is relevant what then what significance does it have if it is relevant and examine that so he says, you know, some, while, while um, the, something new can be pleasing, it can also sometimes be unpleasant. And I was, I saw on YouTube a clip where the comedian Louis CK is talking to Joe Rogan about, you know, how he writes jokes. And he was saying that, you know, he'll have a thought um, and he knows that could be a, a bit in his comedy. And so what he'll do is he, he'll write down a word, just a key word to remember it, but he won't work on it. He'll, he'll start talking about it in front of the audience. And he was saying that, you know, um, Sometimes he'll, he'll do that and, and he'll say something and it'll get an instant laugh. And he says, that's fine, you know, he'll take that, but that that ne never really develops that, um, you know, it, it stays pretty much the same and that's it. Whereas he says when he says something and it gets like what Buck was saying, how the, what something new can be unpleasant or uncomfortable. When he gets that silence, he was saying, the unpleasantness or whatever you call it. That's those those are the, the the bits where he said he knows there's something good to be gotten out of this. And those are the bits that the, he you know that develop and then turn out to be the the best the best sort of jokes or bits in his stand-up. So if Louis C.K. was, and that's, a, you know, that's, I'd say if he was listening or reading what Bach has said, he'd go, oh yeah, that's like, that's like me with my, you know, when I'm coming up with a new, a new um, hour. And that's, that's what that's like. It's the same. So, that's just a reference on the, you know, how, how relevant box words could be. 
as well, Buck, um, you know, he, he's saying about, again, more about the, his basically touching on a similar thing to what I was saying regarding his relevance. And he's saying the same that, you know, if you're not somebody who hasn't heard all sorts of things and, and, and doesn't, and if you don't know how to find the best in everything, you are not in a position to be able to judge anything in music. And like he says, you know, a certain great man, I, I have no idea who that great man is, um, could, could have been his father, I don't know. But they said, you know, where one taste has, can be, you know, better than others, everyone, in, in everyone, is something particularly good hidden. So if you connect that to what Bach said the sentence before about those who don't know how to find the best in everything, well, if you're not able to find what the great man said, you know, there's something especially good hidden in everything if you are not doing that if you are not discovering that or able in a position to be discovering it you are not in a position to judge anything in music and so and that doesn't so that would mean don't listen to yourself when you are to your ego when your ego tells you this isn't relevant don't listen to it because it doesn't know what it's talking about. It's safe to think I better, you know, I should accept this, even if I don't understand the, the, the relevance or the significance of it right now, I should allow it in and let it stay with me so that when I do encounter different situations, it's there and when the ego says, ignore this or pay no attention, you can think, hold on a second. Maybe, you know, maybe I, sh I, I, I should go against my um, better instinct and give this a, a, a certain consideration. Hmm. Um, I wanna say as well about you know, in, in um, paragraph, in paragraph 28, Bach mentions Nock Amungen. So what he's saying is, you know, um, you can practice the ornaments with both hands that he recommends it and that when you're practicing ornaments with both hands it also helps when you're playing other notes so basically it your profici proficiency will increase and i would say um as well if you look at that video you know in in all those episode videos where i talk about virtuosity and that one where i say that hands separately hands together is a myth and how the, the, the hands are linked. And as if you as well look at what I'm saying with the AC fingering um, in the video, you know, in, in some of the, the scales or in box warm up exercises, I present a fingering that's perfectly balanced. And if you have a look at that and then play the ornaments incorporating that what I have shared. You will be able to play the ornaments simultaneously on both hands identically. So you will be playing the ornament on the left hand as good as you play it on the right hand. And that could be an extra 
like way to you know be as as proficient on the left hand playing ornaments as on the right hand where where an ornament on the left hand doesn't cause any sort of concern or anything it's it's as if you encounter it on the right hand it doesn't make a difference whether it's a trill or anything it's it's basically simple not all ornaments are equally simple but let's say a, a trill on the left hand is there's you know when when you use what i have shared there is nothing easier um to do than and playing a trill on the left hand it's just it's 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 nice and you know what's extra nice about it most people would think it's difficult and so you'll be playing this what 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 people would be maybe struggling with you will play play it easily without practice and it's like almost a holiday for you plus you have the advantage that people will think wow that that was really difficult that bit and they did it really well and you'll be laughing because you'll know for you you could have you could be sight reading it the way you're playing it that that's how you would have played it had you sight read that passage yeah so okay the knock amulin so in that paragraph so that's with the practicing the hands together and then he gives examples why it's good to have to, to practice those the, the it on both hands because one there's some ornaments that uh, occur often in the bass like a mordant you'll often find a mordant in the bass the other thing is the knock amulin have to be you know done exactly down to the smallest detail and i just want to explain the knock amulin that that's Imi that's imi uh, an imitation and that can occur i mean not exclusively i'm just i'll tell you what i know that can occur when you're accompanying pieces in the time and, and an imitation is when you know there's a, a, a kind of a melody line a little kind of a, a snippet and then that's echoed or repeated and it can happen that um, when you're accompanying at, uh, in box time that the soloist will have this sort of melody line and then the accompanist, accompanist will it'll be repeated in the bass because the accompanist at the time they're playing from figured bass so they, they're not reading from a score so which they have their their bass line and the the figured bass which indicate what harmonies the, the the accompaniments should play over the bass line and so that's what they work from and so in the left in the in the bass will be that melody repeated that the soloist just did and what will happen in those times is those are the places that when it's repeated that the, those melody lines which are echoed in the bass will be altered and it could be that that melody beforehand is in quavers is a melody in quavers or eight notes and then the bass will be again exactly the same in in, in quavers or eight notes and what will ha happen what's was practiced then in the repeats would be that same in instance of imitation the soloist would play that melody line differently they'd elaborate on it or so instead of it being in quavers or eight notes they might play something that that follows the same kind of essence but it's in semi quavers so it's a altered and, and and it's instead of it being quavers there's it's in semi quavers so in 16 notes and that will mean that the the accompanist will be expected or, or obliged to 
play the, the variation of that imitation the same in order to enhance the effect. And so they'll be as well playing it in 16 notes and they, ideally they'll be playing it exactly as the soloist has, has played it. That's why, you know, it very often, and because it's an, and, and, and it's, it's, it's often kind of becoming more, you know, more noty or more virtuosic, the, the, the repeats, which means that you're going to need more skill in the left hand to be able to imitate the skill of the soloist. So that's one instance where the knock among will come into play. Another one will be in the cadenzas or, you know, like in the formatus where it's, I, I, I see it, those moments where, where you have the format and then it's like a guitar solo basically before the piece ends. And you can, you can hear that in the, the D major, you can hear this knock among that where the right hand will play something and the left hand imitates it. That's as well where the knock among can um, come into play. So that's, that's what they are just to explain that. Yeah. And so he's saying that, you know, there's what's to be gained. And, and he says, so it's important to practice that you're practiced in this trained to, and he says, like, just as an indication, how important it is, he says those ornaments, um, it's better to leave out those ornaments that lose their, you know, their effect when they're badly performed. It's better just to eliminate them completely from your playing. So that's what he's saying. You, you practice, if you practice them and, and, and you, you get good at doing them, you get to have them. But if you haven't practiced them and if they come out badly, it's better not to have them at all. So practicing it, practicing them or not, being practiced in them or not, will mean asking yourself, do I want those ornaments? And if the answer is yes, I do want those ornaments, well then practice them. If the answer is no, just leave them out. Don't do them because they're not worth doing badly. They, you're better off not doing them at all than, and then doing them when you haven't, you know, been practiced in them. So, you know, that's, hmm, that's what he's saying. Um, when Bach talks as well about combining the two, you know, he says the Italian singing style plays in, in, in the taste of today, then a days, that the Italian singing style plays a considerable like contributes considerably to that. So one can't make do with the French ornaments alone. And I would say when um, you're reading that about the neatness and the refinement of the French or way of playing, um, combining it with the flattering or caressing nature of the Italian singing, way of singing. I would connect that to paragraph eight of that chapter where he talks about, you know, the pianist you can pass as complete or perfect who can combine the surprising and fiery and um, that, it, it, that can be done on the instrument, but that can't be sung when they can combine that with the singing way to play their instrument. I would connect those two things together. And I think the more you connect 
the different places where where Bach is that are actually connected in what Bach says. You can it's a it's a good way. I I think so, or I get this sense that it's a it's you start to to learn how Bach feels about things rather than just hearing what he just hearing the information. You can get a, a feeling for how he feels about it. And I think this if you if you keep that with you, if you what Bach says, you know, what does Bach consider the complete pianist? Those who can combine the firing, fiery and surprising with the singing way to play the instrument. If you keep that with you and, and, and don't dismiss it, just, just let, let it be there. So when you encounter different things, that's in, that, that is there, that, that, that can potentially go, hey, is that that there what Bach was talking about? And you can think, hold on, yeah, maybe it is. And you can explore that and you can discover things. And I would say that what he says there about the proper and the refinement of the French and together with the you know the, the, the flattering or the caressing way of the Italian singing that that could shape that could be relevant to your how you see Mozart and what Mozart is doing and I have that feeling that this very much it 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 it, it pierces or it touches into it goes deeper into what Mozart is actually what drives him and and that Mozart would agree with Bach completely because you could perhaps start to hear it in Mozart's this combining the fiery and surprising those things which can't be sung together with the singing way to play the instrument and that Mozart has taken this to heart and has evolved it if you think of well if you if you're if you do start to see Mozart in that way and see his pieces in that way you'll think you could think hold on a second yeah there it is it's just more elaborate it's just done more extravagant extravagantly but it is there and it is a it is something that is missing in interpretations of Mozart. People think it's all to be sung, it's all opera. Um, and they're wrong. It's not all to be sung. There is, the fiery and surprising is combined with the singing way to play the instrument. And if you are trying to sing everything in Mozart, I think you are missing the point and I think keeping this in mind what Bach says is a is a useful thing and and it could it could be I, I, I have no idea did Mozart um, read this book I don't know but he just seemed to be saying you know when he says anybody who knows anything at all about music owes it to him that would mean it, when somebody says that that would say that you know he didn't say except me so i'd wonder how much you know did mozart read that and take it to heart you know was he let's say a teenager and and a hungry mozart said he has studied music he has studied everything in music he didn't you know he's not a natural you know, the people think it mozart as this genius who was given a gift by god and i think the, that's a dangerous view because i think people think think mozart is a, a kind of a a talented idiot you know they don't they 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 think he's he's got this gift wonderful gift but there's no way mozart is more intelligent than we are and and i think 
I get the sense that th that's part of the affection for Mozart because people don't feel threatened. They think he was given a gift by God, but he's a bit of a dope as well. But what if Mozart was, had been more studious, more knowledgeable, with, with, with deeper, more profound understanding of music because of the extent to which all those academics and experts and you know people who who um, build their reputation on how you know on their expertise that he would in their field put them all to shame because he has when they you know he has studied more and he has been able to not only study but penetrate right to the heart of things that he will have studied this book you know considerably and taken it to heart and what we're hearing in Mozart's sonatas is the results of him owing everything he knows to Bach only nobody knows it There was another thing there, um, Bach, when you're talking about taste, when he talks about taste. One observation I want to make is that you, I noticed that he has, he talks about two tastes, two types of taste. One is the taste in terms of the style or, or the, the type of music that's popular. The, the choices the, the, that have, are being made that are popular in the, in the day. So those he calls the gishmake, you know. But there's the other taste, which he doesn't call gishmak, he calls their gute gishmak, the good, good taste, or their fine gishmak, fine taste. And I think this is a, I mean, I know this is an important distinction because good, good taste and fine taste is, has got to do with interpretation, has got to do with how the piece is performed. It's got to do with the details and the other taste has got to do with the the kind of the preferred choice, so to speak. And the question of taste is a uh, it's not defined. And I have this book here. It's Pierre Boulet. Boulez or Boulet, I don't know. I'm sure you've heard of him. He's a very famous composer and conductor and all. He died and this is called Orientations and it's, it's, um, it's a collection of his writings and, and lectures and stuff. And there's one there in from a lecture he did it, you know, gave at Darmstadt in 1961. And it's called it's the title of it is Taste, the Spectacles Worn Worn by Reason. And then there's a question mark. And this was a a, a quote from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a philosopher, <laughs> I think. <laughs> And in this, in this lecture, Bach, or not Bach, Pierre Boulet is, is kind of wondering or, you know, what is taste? How can you define taste? And it's a big question mark and it's a big, or it's a big kind of, wondering, intellectual wondering. And a lot of people would consider this to be, you know, 
like very intellectual and, and elite and you know up there but a lot of it is based on his him not knowing what taste is you know he he writes i don't really know you know i don't want to go into this because the, the the length of time it takes but just to get an idea He's saying, you know, and before I go any further, I must make a digression. What on earth, you may well be asking, made me choose this subject of taste? I know that it is very French and that only a French man would f allow himself to get entangled in the search for such a will-o'-the-wisp as taste. A search is, that is notoriously a fool's errand. No one has talked about taste for years. Romanticism killed the very concept which is purely intellectual and restrictive, totally incompatible with genius, which laughs at rules and tastes, whether it be good or bad. You know, so that's, that's um, just an example of what he's saying in that lecture. He also says, is my taste inextricable inextricably linked to that of the period in which I happen to live? Or can I make my own personal contribution to its formation? Am I the victim of my age's good or bad taste? Am I to revolt and simply to analyze objectively all these criteria, which it seems I shall never succeed in mastering? Are we really so certain of what elegance itself actually represents? According to Rousseau, one listener will value the melodic simplicity while another will attach importance to signs of unusual workmanship and each will give the name of elegance to his favorite taste. This seems to only complicate, complicate matters and to cause still further misunderstanding. So a lot of the, art, of the lecture is based on not really distinguishing between good taste and taste. It's confusing what one picks as opposed to what is done in good taste. And you can have examples, you know, you could have a horror film made where the, the director or the people responsible for it have all, all possess good taste. Or you can have a comedy the same, or a romantic film the same, or a, a drama the same. And afterwards, people will pick the film that suits their taste. So, so you might have a taste for comedies. So out of all of them, even though they have all been made with good taste, you are going to pick the one you prefer. And in the lecture, the um, Boulet is not fully able to differentiate between the taste required to present something with good taste from the taste where people just choose what they prefer. Where you, you know, for that, you, you know, because you prefer comedies does not mean you will be able to um, have the good taste that is needed to make a comedy that is effective and, 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 and knows what it needs to do to be funny. He says as well. How then are we to discover those who have more taste or less taste, or indeed those who may be said to be more or less men of taste? So he doesn't know what taste is, essentially. Rousseau, he, um, Boulet says, said, if unanimity, unanimity is hard to find, the explanation lies in the fact that all men are not equally well educated, or in fact men of taste, 
and that their priorities among natural beauties are often determined arbitrarily by prejudice of habit or education. Natural beauties is a very 18th century term. Are we still so sure that they in fact exist? I suspect that even more than taste, the word natural has been ruthlessly expunged from our vocabulary and that we should find great difficulty in, introduce, in reintroducing it. He also says, Rousseau, it is possible to go on forever discussing taste because there is in fact only one that is true. But I can hardly see any other way of concluding the debate except the show of hands. If we are not ready to acknowledge, acknowledge nature's silent prompting. And Boulet then goes on to say, Anyhow, we now know our fate. We blasphemers who refuse nature. The question of taste is to be decided by a show of hands. So basically, you know, since, since we're, we're not able for, you know, to be better, the best we can do is a show of hands. So we blasphemers who refuse nature because nature is, it takes effort, it takes a, a skill, it takes a, a genius to be able to recognize and see nature as it exists. Like I said, you can spend your whole life in the cage playing notes, never seeing what happens when you move in the world of music, what happens beyond your control. And I wanted to say as well about, well, I'll say it now in case I forget. You know, with, with the good taste and, and what, what you have here is somebody very high up in the intellectual sphere wondering what is taste, whereas what you're getting here, and this is just to show because it won't be recognizable. You might never have tasted wine. And let's say somebody gives you the, the best bottle of wine ever made to taste and you taste it. You are not going to say, wow, this is amazing. What you are going to think is, oh, so this is what wine tastes like. Yeah, it's nice. It's only, you know, it's only the people who know all these things who have immerse themselves in, 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 in what, you know, the elites are talking about, will recognize, wow, this is an incredible bottle of wine. Anybody who's never tasted wine will just think that's what wine tastes like. We have, we, it's, 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 in a way it's useful. It helps us survive the, how overwhelming, profound, well, overwhelmingly, profound nature is you know like if you're you know if you witness the the birth of your child or something it's so incredible that you know that the creation of life and, and 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 being born and existing and not existing and yet we can cope with it and move on and 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 you know pick ourselves up we're not completely overwhelmed we can we can take it so in a way if we if we weren't able to take it if we were always blown away by something incredible we'd be we'd be a wreck we'd be in bits so in a way it's a useful survival but that's what happens and so what you're getting here with Bach is he is not only he is giving you specifics. He is giving you the chance to know what good taste is, to truly understand what good taste is. Because part of good taste is ornament, playing ornaments that hang the notes together. And those ornaments that don't perform badly when they don't hang the notes together, that is bad taste. And so everybody in that honor all 
honor roll and it doesn't matter if nobody writes anything in the honor roll i've said it and and that's that's what's important to me because at the end of the day if it's ever come back to i have said it you know now i've said it before other people say it so but it would be great if there was an honor roll what you are hearing in all those recordings where the, the, the ornament indicated by small notes is played before the bass note where the principal note comes together with either the bass note or an other, other voices simultaneously and the other voice can be the other note of an octave like in the, in, in the slave of all where the, in the ornament indicated with small notes is played before and you plump in with on the octave well the bottom note of that octave should be played the, the the ornament with small notes should be played simultaneously with the other note of that octave and the top note of the octave it's it's slid into through the ornament when you're not doing like that what you are hearing is bad taste and i think in mozart there is no better place to hear bad taste in the recordings of the great pianists playing Mozart. There are, there are so many instances of bad taste there. It's just, I, I, you probably, it could be, you know, the place where you hear the most bad taste and the most bad taste has been accepted and people don't know what taste is. You know, here, this is a whole lecture where basically the, the, the point is, I've no idea what taste is. He writes, too rich a genius needs a severe critic to ensure that he does not abuse his wealth. Great things may be achieved without taste, but it is taste that makes them interesting. How precisely we are not told. Bach is transcending this level. He is going higher to a place of greater insight, greater genius, and he is telling you if the ornaments don't hang the notes together, that is bad taste, that is doing damage to good taste. And he's telling you exactly what good taste is. Good taste is understanding nature, is, is, is noticing what happens when you play something. And people who play notes, all they do is play notes. They only understand notes. They don't understand anything. And then to those notes, you're meant to add stuff from the shopping list. Like get a bit louder here, make it softer, maybe you slow down here a bit, or bring bring these notes out. It's all and 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 they're all confusing personal preferences. I prefer it to be loud here. I prefer it to be a bit softer. They they confuse that with taste, and it's not. And Bach is telling us exactly what taste is. Something that Pierre Boulez was searching for. The answer he was searching for and didn't find. Bach is providing that answer. Pierre Boulez says, is it in fact possible to separate genius from taste? Is not taste an integral part of genius? Taste is, I would say the taste is the key to genius. That it is the good taste that Mozart and Beethoven and Bach, they are the epitome of good taste. So if they weren't, they could not have composed. All these people with bad taste, you will, they will not be good composers. They will not be able to compose because they do not 
possess good taste. They don't even know what it is. Bach, Mozart, and, and Beethoven, it was their good taste that was, is, was essential to their composition. Essential to them being able to compose the masterpieces they composed. And for, for to be so much bad taste in Mozart, one, you know, when taste, when good taste is a key to genius, it means that if you are hearing bad taste in Mozart, that is not all those, and, and, and you'll, you'll, you can think of it. You know, there's always bits in Mozart that sound a bit crap. And, you know, and, and I think people sort of overlook it. They think Mozart was a genius, so it's okay. This must be good. And I personally think that's disrespectful because when I hear those moments, I think Mozart was a genius. There is no way he could have written something that sounds so crap and wanted it to have sound so crap. And I have found out that it doesn't sound so crap. And why it sounds so crap is because people are imposing their mediocrity, their bad taste onto Mozart. And it's really the stamp of mediocrity you're listening to when you hear all those recordings of Mozart where all that bad taste is in, a, in excess. And, and you're hearing how mediocrity attacks genius and you are not hearing the Mozart's good taste. It's getting lost, it's, it's getting attacked, destroyed and eradicated by mediocrity. And you're hearing from Bach what exactly good taste is. And in the instance of ornaments, here you're hearing it in the instance of ornaments, good taste exists in all aspects of piano playing, in all aspects of music, in all aspects of understanding nature, the nature of music. There is not a single aspect. The more you can recognize and see nature at work, in music, the better your taste is going to be and you will know exactly how, when and what to do, what is appropriate. And I will say as well, good taste can be the difference between being able to play something and being not being able to play something. That, that's how significant good taste is. So with good taste, you will be playing an ornament or you will be using an ornament that means, makes you able to play that particular bit. Whereas bad taste, which would mean a, a, the wrong ornament or the, the right ornament played wrongly, will mean you won't be able to play that bit. And the bad taste exists, you know, in the case of uh, kissing or something. He has a level of skill that means he is able to play things in bad taste and still be able to play it like, and uh, you know, the average person will think, wow, that's perfect. Because he possesses that level of skill, he can do that. But he has to work harder in order to do that because of the bad taste that he is exercising. And I don't mean this is a, it, this is not personal preference. This is not personal taste. Good taste is being, moving in accordance with nature, not committing crimes against nature. It's not about, oh, well, you're just, you know, you're just an asshole if you think that's in bad taste because obviously it's perfect. It's not about that. He can do it because he's kissing. Whereas you, if you try and do the same thing, you are gonna have a much harder time because you're not possess his level of skill. But it's not necessary for you to possess his level of skill to do the r bad things, you know, pass off bad things as good. 
you can do the good things and it, it, you you will notice when 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 you learn more when you hear more of when we get into specifics of the different kinds of ornaments you are going to exchange what you thought was the right ornament for the right ornament and you will notice that in a, in a phrase that you couldn't play before all of a sudden you can play because you are exercising when you exchange the wrong ornament for the right ornament you are exercising good taste so Bach is giving specifics something which you know in, in, in this elite intellectual expertise there is no answer Bach is providing an answer this is how valuable how important and 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 the thing is this sounds more impressive it's it's just like with the you know the treffers or the the fast people from who play fast from profession they set the face in wonder but leave the soul nothing to do this as well you get an onslaught of big words and and fancy talk but you're left with no substance no answers just a whole pile of uh, questions you know a lot of uh, 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 probably the most popular way to sound intelligent is just go on asking lots of of intelligent questions questions that make it look like only an intelligent person could ask such questions but i i don't want to do that i decided a long time ago i only want to deal in answers and providing answers doesn't set the face in wonder but it will give you something to do something definite to do so you are hearing from Bach what good taste actually is in specifics in something you can use because when you think of the taste spectacles worn by reason as is what the taste is you can think you can understand yeah well if you think through it yeah okay it makes sense like if you think the spectacles is the insight and when you look at stuff with insight the reason can recognize then when you hear the ornament joining the notes together or moving them the apart or separating them pushing them away from each other the insight or it's the spectacles and your reason is able to pick the ornament that joins the notes together you can see how you know okay taste the, the spectacles worn by reason yes that could be true you could say that's correct but you will never understand what taste is the only way that's going to be useful or you'll be able to do anything that is if you know what taste is and like sort of work in reverse back but you will never find taste from that explanation he gives a so you read the the uh, the lecture and it's it's all you know big words and and hard to follow and um at one point he um boulet says shall i give you an example and i, I at that point there i'm thinking you know yes please give me an example to you know give me give me something to work on or to go with and so the example is he gives is a composer's use of any form of sound complex is guaranteed stylistically speaking by the function of that complex in a field of morphology guaranteed moreover by its overall function as determined by syntax what remains is the irrational element namely the choice involved in giving this complex the position and the form most appropriate appropriate to any given moment of a work <laughs> you know so that's you know that's the highfalutin intellectual now it's a bit like you know for all the people in the audience and all the nodders and the people going it's a bit like the emperor's new clothes and you know when when you when you're able to see through it when you're able to you know when you know what the words means and you're able to discount 
all that. It's like a, it's like a, a, an impressive way of saying I have no clue. And at the end of the lecture, he says, so I think the best thing to think of this evening as though, uh, sorry. So I think the best thing is to think of this evening as though it had never existed, as something like taste itself, impossible to grasp, present everywhere and nowhere. So what he concluded is taste is impossible to gra grasp. But that is not what Bach is saying. Bach knows what good taste is because he differentiates taste and good taste. Taste is preference. Taste is preference. Good taste is um, dealing with the specifics, is, is, is knowing, like in the case of ornaments, knowing when an ornament hangs the notes together or doesn't. That is good taste. You know, Rousseau said, taste is not identical with sensibility. Great taste is by no means incompatible with a frigid temperament. And there are people who are insensitive to charm in a work of art, though carried away by real passion. It appears that taste is more concerned with the small expressions of feeling and sensibility with the large. So there Rousseau was basically saying what I was saying about the diff, you know, the taste sensibilities are cons concerned with the large, you know, what are the, the film is a romance or a comedy or a horror. Whereas taste is the presentation of each, is the presentation of like a, 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 in the slave of all that piece of metal, that phrase where the notes are hung together or they're driven apart. Good taste hangs the notes together, bad taste drives them apart. And what Bach says, you know, um, in that, in the, in the paragraph, and it could be with all the unnatural innovations that could good taste can become as rare as the knowledge. You know, that is Bach again, in terms of relevance, how relevant is it what Bach says? That is Bach making a prediction. And if only we had a time machine where we could see, did it come true? And well, that role of honor, that could be a time machine. And you can, it could be seen on the extent of just how many people are on that role of honor, how relevant or correct Bach was um, in his prediction about good taste becoming so rare. And, and, and if, let's say, all the great pianists are on that role of honor, that just shows how rare good taste is because the way they've performed those ornaments indicated by small notes where the principal note lands simultaneously with the beat instead of the ornament being played simultaneously with the bass note or other notes or on the beat, that that is bad taste. And we just see how rare good taste has become. You know, and, and, and say to Bach, look, here you go, Bach. We've, we've come up with something and, and it shows you, yeah, you were wondering, will good taste become as rare as the knowledge? And, and in the last video as well, I was saying, how come nobody knows this? So how relevant is that what Bach says? And how true was it? How big is that honor roll? So it's a, it, it, it trans, it is better than this. What Bach provides is better than this, is better than the intellectuals, better than the elites, better than the experts, better than the great pianists. You are getting something 
that is so rare you don't even know it exists you don't even notice that it's not there you know you're getting stuff that will be absent in TED talks on on YouTube they are on a level lower than this that insight it, pinpointing sp sp specific you know like with specifics telling us what good taste is and good taste is observing and seeing nature seeing what it is noticing what it is you're that's there before you and not seeing it in 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 a certain context or true you know true bias or what you've learned is actually noticing what is there the ability to do that and recognize what it is you're noticing that is good taste and that is you apply that in your interpretation in your performance in your um, decision of of the details and taste in terms of what you prefer in general has got nothing to do with good taste it is something separate and different and the last thing he says about at the very end of the chapter and it's funny how the the the, par the chapters have to end with the you know the shortcomings of the publishers and uh, the ex the explanation of the ornaments in the, in the edition shot of his sonatas that go with this book with the there's mistakes in those in the explanation of the ornaments and I was going to bring them up as we get to them and they are blatant they are mistakes made by people who haven't read what Bach says because Bach says emphatically again like he's talking to morons he makes it the foolproof that you couldn't possibly get it wrong and yet they get it wrong and I have heard in in performances that I've seen in YouTube by authentic people that they are copying the explanation of the ornaments provided by edition shot and so I was going to I'm going to bring them up at when you know when it applies when we get there but I would wonder are they the exact same explanation of the ornaments that Bach is talking about here that they're wrong? Did edition shot just include the, or the explanation of the ornaments that the publisher who had the effrontery or who was, was not ashamed to publish together with the sonatas under Bach's name, although it was against Bach's knowledge and he didn't want it? Did they just you know put the same stuff out again even though box says here that is wrong and it did addition shot again just like they didn't do with the um with Bach giving specific directions about the stems on the notes saying they are specifically directed like that to help the the you know the student did they ignore it and just print the exact same incorrect explanation of the ornaments that everybody is following? That's where I, 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 I just see it. I see the wrong way people playing the ornaments the wrong way, exactly the way it's said to do in the explanation there. And there you can see, again, the relevance. We have Bach... I mean, Bach is calling out the publishers that it, it's it's wrong what they're doing. He calls them out, and yet here we are. But these are urtext people. These are the greats. These are the ones who go to the cocktail party, and everybody is 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 like crawling up their ass. So there's again just we'll we'll see that when we get to it I'll point out where
where they're wrong, you'll see just how egregious their incompetence is, their, their ignorance, their just short-sightedness, their, their basically their laziness. And you'll see that what Box says is as relevant today as it was then.